Hello again, and welcome to Becoming Naomi Leon. Uh, this is actually our second recording. Um, the first of the this recording had some crazy feedback in it because we're still trying to work out the tech issues and all of the things that are kind of uh, plaguing you guys as well, I'm sure. Um, I am going to mention that I have been, you know, taking a look at our Google, our uh, YouTube channel feed, and um, I will suggest that if you are the person who is, you know, disliking uh, the recording, you can stop watching. You have that freedom. Read the book on your own. You will be responsible for the information at some point or another, um, as best as we can uh, have you be responsible for it. Uh, read the book on your own, find a different recording. Sorry. Um, also, because Allison complained that in the previous videos I was not wearing ears, I have added ears. Stacy has her ears. There are ears. Okay, Allison? Ears. Great. Um, Mr. Nar, my, my narwhal, his name is Fazio. Fazio has joined me today. Um, he uh, wrote up some notes on, on, on the chart paper behind me uh, so that he could keep track of some of our thinking. Um, you can't really see, but you see he's got a little marker. He's all set. Oh, Forky. Oh, Forky. Oh. You know what I like about this? This is stuff Stacy and I already have in our apartments. Chapter three. Trash. I am trash. Okay. I love him. He's a little booby eye. He's so cute. All right. I have to stay muted, guys, because it as she said it gets funky. All right, mute. Okay. <laughs> Chapter three, a lamentation of swans. Lament lament, sorry, is one of your spelling words. Um animals pop up a lot in this in every uh, chapter, it is the beginning, it is the title for every chapter, and you can usually find the swan or the animal somewhere in there at some point. Um, and um, so listen out for the animal. Okay, so a lamentation of swans. Dripping wet. Graham didn't weigh a hundred pounds, and even wearing her running shoes, she didn't reach five feet tall. Now, sitting down with her skinny neck drooping over the table, she looked like a swan peering into a lake. Owen and I slid in across from her. She folded her hands and looked at us. Her face seemed tired, but not happy tired, like after working in the garden all day with Fabiola. Instead, it was worried tired I saw in her eyes, as if something bad was about to happen. The purple and yellow curlers on her head seemed much too cheerful for her face. I know you probably don't remember much about your mother, said Graham, talking real slow as if we wouldn't understand her if she sped up. I've told you the story of how Terry Lynn came to live with me. We had heard it, but only once in glorified detail, because Graham was not one for rehashing events from the past. Owen and I had retold it to each other so many times that we might as well have been reciting it from a storybook. It had started way back after Graham was widowed. Her daughter got married and ran off to live in Kentucky. Graham said it broke her heart to lose her only child to folks in a state so far away. Her daughter and son-in-law had one child, Terry Lynn. Graham had only seen her a few times during her young life. Then, when Terry Lynn was a teenager, her parents suffered a car crash and died two weeks later in the hospital. Terry Lynn was sent to live with her other grandparents. From what Graham could figure out, Terry Lynn defied them so much that they finally didn't want her anymore. 
Graham was her only other living relative, so they put Terry Lynn on a bus to Lemon Tree. She arrived mad at the world and almost grown. So Terry Lynn was defying her other grandparents. She was defiant, which I think says a lot about her character. If you're not sure what the word defiant means, defiant is when, so for example, uh, a student uh, has been asked by their teacher to maybe stop doing something. And that student would say, look the teacher directly in the eye and then continue doing that thing anyway, then they would be defying their teacher's request and being defiant. But the teacher can't send them to go live with their other grandparents. When she came to live with me, there just wasn't much I could do with her, wild as she was, said Graham. And then, and then, then Walker Gordon had their summer company picnic and you brought Skyla, I continued. And Fabiola and Bernardo brought some men who were visiting them from their town in Mexico. Graham nodded. Terry Lynn met Santiago, a gentle, sweet man and so handsome. He looked like those Latin singers you see in magazines. He was smart and full of life and spoke English enough to get by. Those two loved each other like crazy, for a while at least. They were really just children themselves. Then they got married, said Owen. Then they had Naomi. Then they had me. They lived in a little studio apartment, but it was like putting a pack of angry cats in a wood box, said Graham, shaking her head. The obligations of you two came into the stew and their marriage just never thickened. They thought that if they went to Mexico, everything would be better. Then they took us to Rosarita Beach so our dad could make lots of money fishing and our mom could make lots of money braiding people's hair on the beach, said Owen. Then they got a divorce and our dad stayed in Mexico and our mom went to find her life and we came to live with you. My apartment was small as a cracker tin, said Graham. And here I was with you two and Owen a whirling dervish. My notion was that children needed wide open space to be wild monkeys. Fabiola told me about the trailer rancho, rancho and how it backed up to all the avocado trees. I suspected that Fabiola and Bernardo wanted us close so they could, could help out with you kids. They always felt kin to you, being that your dad was from their town. Kin, we've heard that word used before, right, Stacy? Kin? Yeah, we, it's, that's definitely been a, a spelling word. Or it ha has it? Yeah, I think. And it did has. Oh, maybe not kin. I feel like it has it, but then I always get confused, like, it could have been last year's class, you know? Yeah. Uh, I remember sentences, but I could have been last year's sentences. Oh, this book. Or he's got to sit over here. Um, yeah, so. But yeah. weren't the, the Karna, Mar, Jive and Rictus. Jive and Rictus. I Sorry. I'm officially Max. I like it. He's so cute. Look. Look up. Look at that face. Look. Oh. They always felt kin to you, being that your dad was from their town. And well, I thought it would be good for you to be around them and exposed to your Mexican side. You filled in real nice, I said, patting Graham's hand. Now our mother is back, said Owen, looking confused. Is that a good thing? Owen, honey, it's the good and the bad I'm worried about, said Graham. 
One of her favorite sayings was that the good and the bad of any situation were sometimes the same. When I was younger, I had trouble holding my brain on that thought. But now it was starting to make sense. I even had a list in my notebook called things that were the good and the bad all rolled into one. One, we had a trailer, so we lived real simple and without a lot of stuff. Two, we had avocados growing nearby and could eat as many as we wanted to the point of getting sick. Three, Graham was an expert seamstress and made all of our clothes out of polyester blend remnants. And four, Graham was retired and could devote her every waking moment to me and Owen. Now I would have to add five. Our mother came back. What did Graham suspect the bad would be? Where's she gonna sleep? asked Owen. How about she sleeps in my bed? and I could sleep on the floor. I pretend I'm camping. Baby Beluga had a living room slash kitchen, Owen's and my bedroom with two side-by-side -side captain's beds with drawers underneath, a short hall that ran right into Graham's bedroom and a tiny bathroom. That was it. I think we're awful close to camping already, said Graham. She can sleep on the fold out under the table. Where did she go, said Owen. Out, Graham frowned. Maybe she'll be right back, said Owen, his voice excited. Maybe she just went out to pick up a pizza and ice cream so we could sit around together and talk about what we've been doing for all these years. Graham and I looked at him. His never ending good nature was grating on me. Owen, said Graham. I give you more credit than that. What's the word you always use to describe Owen, Stacy? Optimistic. Optimistic, just in case. I don't know. I, I, I find uh, the optimism a little cloying, just like uh, Naomi does, because I'm not a very optimistic person. Yeah, well, you are, you are naming. I'm definitely not Owen Iyer, hello. <laughs> I'm always like, looking for the, the not good, the good thing. Okay. We heard a quick double knock on the door, then it opened. Hola, hello, I am here. I made tapioca. It was Fabiola just in time for Wheel of Fortune. She held a ceramic bowl and wore one of those flowered bib aprons that went over her head, but she was so short and round that the apron was rolled up at the waist so it wouldn't drag on the floor. Graham and Fabiola's Graham said Fabiola's mission in life was to feed the world with a smile. Her face was set with lots of little smile wrinkles sitting next to her eyes and framed with brown permanent waved curls. And I had never once seen her without her little gold dot earrings. Fabiola took one look at Graham's face and asked, what has happened, Maria? Mary was Graham's given name, but Fabiola always called her the Spanish version. Terry Lynn was here. She's come back. But we're not supposed to call her Terry Lynn, said Owen, because she changed her name to Skyla, after the sky. Skyla, said Fabiola, her forehead wrinkling. No one said a word. I could hear water trickling from one of the neighbor's garden hoses. In just a few seconds, Fabiola's face changed to worried, tired too. Come said Fabiola, setting the tapioca on the table. We must tell Bernardo. Graham got up and put on her sweater. Then she handed Owen and me our sweatshirts. I looked at Owen. His eyes grew big and his mouth dropped open. He slid off the bench, opened the drawer, took out a roll of tape and studied it. Then he stuffed the whole thing in his pocket. I picked up my notebook. 
took Owen's hand and followed Graham and Fabiola out the door. That was the instant I knew with conviction that Skyla walking through the doorway of baby Beluga was life-changing serious. I knew it for two reasons, and I suspect Owen knew it too. First, Graham had marched outside the trailer, trailer and was following Fabiola into the avocado grove still wearing her clown head. Second, and what locked the possibility of catastrophe in my mind was that Graham and Fabiola were going to miss Wheel of Fortune. And that was going to mess up their 744 nights in a row record. Thoughts? 740, remember I did this yesterday. 365 days in a year, 744 nights in a row. So I'm wondering how, like, how many years is that? That's more than one year. So how yeah. long? 144 nights. We have some people in our class that can figure that out. Um, I, it might have talked again. It's like when I read, I've read this book so many times and I always hear something different. So I'm thinking baby beluga. Beluga is a whale. So that's an animal. Did they say that in the beginning that they named it after? Like the beluga is a whale? Let's look back. But if they don't, that's, that's just like you said, like big pattern is animals, even the name of the trailer. It just after. says that's what Graham calls it, the beluga. A beluga whale. It looks like a whale. Yeah. If you look at if you look up a trailer, it's the silver ones. I used to love those. I had a friend ha that had one of those when I was little. Oh, we never actually went in it. I mean, we would go on it when it was parked in their driveway, but I actually never like went camping in it. But yeah, but that's what that was my thought, the baby beluga. Okay. Um, I was thinking about the Are you on mute? No. No. I was just scared to talk because I don't know if it's you know. Okay. I was thinking about how the instant she knew with conviction that this was life-changing serious and how many of us, what moment each of us could point to in our current situation that helped us to realize, wow, this is going to be a life-changing moment. All right. I remember yesterday you said yours, but I don't know if you want to hold off. Oh, it was for me it was when they closed school. I don't know if you didn't want to give you one to mention it again. Yeah. Um, Mine started, I think. I mean, I, the closest school definitely solidified it. But when they started canceling, like, NCAA and, you know, things that I knew that for the world and America made a lot of money for people and they canceled it, I was like, mm, this, is, this is serious. But then, like Natty, when the schools closed and it affected me personally, I was like, and we're done. <laughs> Guys, remember how early I said, this is my chair where I read in? It is so uncomfortable. I cannot get comfortable. Sorry, I rant. <laughs> I give up. Oh, I'm so uncomfortable. I miss Stacy so much. It's like the worst. Um, chapter four, a memory of elephants. A floodlight cast a path of brightness straight through the avocado grove. Not that we needed it. Over the years, we had worn a foot trail to Fabiola's front door and could get there blindfolded. Up ahead, the glow lit up the yard like a bright island and the tree branches seemed like giant black umbrellas over our heads. We passed the chickens, who made gentle clucking sounds as we walked by their makeshift wire coop. Normally, we'd stop to pet them, but Graham and Fabiola had a purpose to their walk that said no stopping. They led us into the little clearing toward the flat-roofed house. Lulu, Fabiola's miniature poodle, ran toward us yapping 
her bobbed tail wagging back and forth and her black curls shimmying with excitement, Owen picked her up. Bernardo came out of his work shed and stood in the square of light from the doorway, holding a piece of sandpaper and a short plank of wood. He was barely taller than a fence post with skin the color of toasted almonds. When he first saw us hurrying toward him, he tipped his straw cowboy hat back on his gray haired head and smiled wide, not even minding that he was showing us his crooked teeth, some of them pointing sideways. Que paso? He, what happened? He asked, his smile fading. Fabiola spoke in Spanish, the words racing off her tongue. She ended the string of sentences by putting her hands on her hips and saying, Skyla. A body would think that since I was half Mexican, I could speak the language too, but I couldn't. I understood just a little from being around Bernardo and Fabiola all these years, but whenever I tried to copy them, the, world's, the words felt like marbles moving around in my mouth. Bernardo looked suspiciously around the yard as if someone might be watching this and said, we should go inside. Fabiola and Bernardo's small house was wide open spacious compared to our trailer. It had three bedrooms, one of them set up as a full on sewing room where Graham and Fabiola still did alterations. Currently, they were working every day on a bride's gown and 14 bridesmaid dresses for a wedding com coming up for the first weekend in December. In the living room, striped crocheted blankets rested on the back of the couch and chairs, colorful braided rugs made little bridges from one room to another, and Bernardo's bookshelves hung on every wall. Photographs of their two sons from high school graduations and in their United States Navy uniforms crowded the end tables, along with school pictures of Owen and me. Without saying a word, we all sat in our spots in the living room, Bernardo in the recliner with Owen on his knee, Fabiola on one corner of the couch and me on the other with Lulu wriggling between us and Graham in the straight back rocker. I opened my notebook and waited. Graham said, Naomi, I'm not sure taking notes is in order. Just in case, I whispered. I didn't want to forget anything important that might be said. Graham took a deep breath. I always worried this day might come. What's going to happen? I asked, my voice barely a breath. I'm not sure, said Graham. I suppose she has a right to visit you and you have a right to get to know her. More than that, I want her to see that you kids are healthy and happy and dug in deep here with me. I hope I can remember to call her Skyla. I just don't want to get her riled. The children. She could take them, asked Fabiola. When she showed up on my doorstep seven years ago, said Graham, I didn't know if they'd be with me for a few weeks or a few months. I knew enough to have Skyla write out a letter, giving me permission to get them doctors and medicine if they needed, and to enroll them in school and such. But other than that, I don't have claim to them, except that I raised them after so many years of her being absent. I added my last name to Owen's and Naomi's on all their records and papers so we'd have a frame for a family. That was just my fancy and not legal-like. Before that, our names had been Owen Soledad Leon and Naomi Soledad Leon. When Graham tagged on her last name Outlaw, I took it in stride until this year, since it made her so happy until this year because the boys are making fun of her because, you know, I guess they have nothing better to do. She has had a very difficult life, said Fabiola. Maybe she's growing up now and wants to present herself to Naomi and Owen, and that is why she is here. I thought Fabiola leaned toward Owen's disposition when it came to looking on the bright side of everything. I would sorely like to believe she's changed, said Graham. Changed? I said, Naomi, she was always as temperamental as a bead of water on a hot skillet. I'm hoping she has settled some. Graham always talks in similes. She uses similes a lot. You want the children to stay here with us? Asked Bernardo. Graham didn't answer right away. 
No, better wear together. She took a deep breath and stood up. I should get them in bed and make up the fold out. Fabiola stood up and gave Graham a big hug. Graham's eyes watered up. Fabiola hugged me and Owen too. Then Bernardo walked us all the way to the edge of the grove. Graham swiped at her eyes in the dark of the trees. I had never once seen Graham cry from sadness and was not accustomed to seeing her unsettled by her emotions. My insides wobbled as if I was standing on a three-story roof looking down. I bet a lot of us right now have been noticing some grown-ups displaying some emotions that might be unsettling to us. And maybe we're a little bit like, whoa, I don't think I've ever seen my grown-up look like that or feel like that. And it might be unsettling for us to see their grown-ups react that way. Probably. I've seen my parents reacting in not the right way and they're old. Yeah, my parents have been reacting not the right way, but hey. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, if that's not a story, our students need to hear. <laughs> anyway, after I was in bed, I closed my eyes, but couldn't sleep. I tried as hard as I could remember, I, as hard as I could to remember something about my mother. Memories from a place far away in my mind struggled to get to the front of my brain. They swam in slow motion, stroking through thick syrup toward my clear thinking spot. All that surfaced was my past imaginings of what she might be like. Over the years, the top three on my preferred list of possible moms were, one, volunteer, two, business, three, nursery. I had pretended she was one of those smiling moms who came to school twice a week, volunteered in class, and helped with yard duty. She invited my friends over after school and was president of the parent-teacher group. And all the teachers fought over me every year because they knew if they got me in their class, they would get my wonderful mom too. Sometimes I imagined a business mom who wore suits fancy scarves, diamond earrings, and high heels that clickety-clacked down the halls on a monopeia. She would visit my class on career day and talk about her important job in a big office in San Diego. I even thought she might be like some of the moms who worked in the plant nursery nearby. She'd wait on the corner to walk Owen and me home from school every afternoon wearing a green stained apron and holding a bouquet of flowers. But right off the mark, Scar Skyla didn't match my list or fit the pictures in my mind. I did have one recollection of my father and Mexico. Owen and I were huddled in a room near the ocean. I could hear thunder and lightning and waves crashing. It was raining so hard that the roof leaked. And when I looked up through the sprinkles of water, I saw a swirl of color, a bobbing, dangling dance of pink and blue and yellow above my head. What could that have been? A dream? I remember Owen pointing to the ceiling and laughing in that way he had like a batter of coughing and giggling. I rocked him, afraid to move off the bed. I cried and cried until our father rushed in. He swooped us up into his arms and took us to an old church where people had gathered, seeking safety from the storm. We were in a basement, cots set up in rows and women serving soup. I remember crying into my father's flannel shirt, which tasted salty. To get my mind off the thunder and lightning, he found a bar of soap and carved an elephant. He gave it to me and I fell asleep clutching it. When I woke up, he was gone and never came back. Bernardo always said my talent for carving must have passed from my father's hands to mine. I would have rather had my father. I pried the rest of the story out of Graham when I got older. She explained that our father had been on a fishing trip and our mother was supposed to be watching us. 
She had taken off, though, on a shopping trip to Tijuana and left us alone to babysit ourselves in the motel room. Then the storm hit. Nobody could find our mother for days. She finally showed up at the church a week later, packed us up, and took us back to Lemon Tree. She, couldn't, she told Graham that she couldn't handle two kids by herself, especially with one of them deformed. A few days later, she was gone too. I squirmed in bed trying to get comfortable, but my mind was still a jumble. I finally got up and pulled a box from the drawer under my bed. I opened it and carefully, carefully dug through my soap carvings of turtles, dogs, and reptiles and pulled out a family of elephants. I arranged them on the built-in shelf above my bed, all in a line, trunks to tail. Then I put my head down on my pillow and closed my eyes, the caravan of milky statues guarding my dreams. Do you remember the title of the chapter? A Memory of Elephants? I meant it a couple times. And what are elephants known for? The memory. And big ears. Ears. Dumbo, I'm looking for you. Not, not panda ears, I guess. Not cat ears. Not narwhal ears. Do narwhals have ears? Fazio doesn't, and he's feeling very called out right now for not having any. A collection of narwhals is. Pod. That in the thing this morning. Never mind. That wasn't your message this morning. I'm sorry. I did read it. <laughs> I did read it, I swear. A pod. Okay. So I added a few things to um, a chart here, and I think we can add a few more, or Fazio will add them later. So I added in that Naomi, our narrator, is in fifth grade. She doesn't talk a lot and she talks softly. She makes lists and she carves soap animals. I added that Owen is Naomi's younger brother. He has a gravelly voice. He uses his comfort tape. He has some physical issues, or as Skyla called him, deformed. He's very smart, wants a bike, and he's, as Stacy says, optimistic. We have Graham, she's the great grandmother. She's old, takes care of Naomi and Owen. Her daughter died. Uh, she raised Skyla. It's her granddaughter. And, which is her granddaughter. And she speaks in similes. Then I added Skyla, formerly Terry Lynn. She's Naomi and Owen's mother. She's been missing for seven years. Changed her name and her hair color. She was described as having the M of her lips colored in with the lipstick. Clive is her boyfriend who's working on, on learning tattoo and dragons and flames. Uh, she was orphaned, technically. Her parents died in the hospital after a car accident. Um, she's defiant. Uh, she was married to Santiago, who is the children's father. We've got Fabiola and Bernardo on the end here. Um, that's how Skyla and Santiago met. Um, Fabiola and Bernardo are from Mexico and they're Graham's friends. And we know and that- a dog named Lulu. And the dog named Lulu. Oh, this one, our second Lulu. Oh yeah, second Lulu. That's something you guys can start doing um, in your notebooks, is making some lists, like Naomi, of some things that um, you're noticing. Um, that are familiar to you from other stories we've read. Stacy, can you mute? I'm getting feedback. And also, um, you can start thinking about the animals, what they're representing maybe, um, some other things that you're 
noticing are happening a lot. Um, and also start sending me some things that you're wondering. Um, this is some stuff we know about our characters, but what are you wondering about what's going to happen, about uh, what will happen to particular characters, um, what major events might be in the middle of the book? Remember, we're just at, just finished chapter four. We're not anywhere near the middle of the book. What do you think might be the major action that happens at the middle of the book? Some rising action, some things that might lead us there. Those are some things you can start scribbling down in your reader's notebook. Just remember to date everything. You don't need to hand in anything just now. We'll start talking a little bit more about those um, in the coming weeks. And um, I hope you're enjoying the read aloud. If not, please don't dislike. All right. I'm unmuted so I can say bye. Not to you, because I'm sure I'll see you again, but to them. Till we meet again. Till we meet again. Oh, um, Forky says bye. Forky says bye. I'm trash. I am trash. That's all he says. I am trash. You're not trash, Forky. This is who I, this is like, this is basically what I'm talking to at this point, once I hang out with Miss Nadia. I've been talking to Foxio for a while now. Oh, Foxio. Maybe Fatsia and Forky can meet one day. Can you imagine what that conversation would be like? Like the things they would say about us. Yeah, it's mostly like they're crazy. Yeah, they would like take off. They would they would go and quarantine themselves. Yeah. It's all over. All right, guys. Till next time. Bye.